All right, welcome back to the fourth and final episode of the Baseball America Summit Series. Talking Dynasty Baseball today. It's my birthday episode, as I said out there on Twitter. Uh, also, I have two of my favorite uh, people in the industry, two uh, uh, guests that I respect immensely. An old timer, a newcomer, so to speak, I think in terms of like the heavy hitters out there. With, with prospect and dynasty coverage, um, Chris Blessing of Baseball HQ and Chris Clegg of Dynasty Dugout. And of course, uh, congratulations, Chris, on doing this full time. Thank I'm you. Somebody who also uh, made that jump from, you know, chasing that dream for a while and getting the opportunity to do it full time. So I wanted Appreciate to it. take this opportunity to, you know, sort of give you your congratulations, give you your flowers, <laughs> all that sort of thing. Uh, well, thanks, Jeff. Of course. Alongside me as well is the best fantasy baseball player in the world. That's Dylan White. You can you can challenge him, but he's got he's got the receipts to prove it. So what's going on, Dylan? How are you? I hadn't given you like a really obnoxious intro in a while, so I wanted to give you one this week. Yeah, I, I've been missing it. Mm. Um, <laughs> no, I'm doing okay. I, long day, but uh, always happy to talk fantasy baseball. And uh, yeah, I, same thing. Chris and Chris, like two extremely you know revered members of the space that I uh, I highly respect and highly regard and and read all their work so <laughs> and listen to all their podcasts so yeah happy to have them on board and uh happy birthday Jeff is that why we're not having one next week is it because can't nowhere to go but down after this no, I'm actually gonna be in a <laughs> on a plane next week flying to Florida so I will I will be touching down in Tampa around the time that we typically would go live. And uh, I'm just not, uh, I'm not going to push myself up against that where I have like 30 minutes to get the rental car and then drive the 15 minutes to where I'm staying and then set up shop and go live. That seems like a bit much. So maybe, maybe I'll do something at first pitch next week. I don't know. We'll have to talk to the people at Baseball HQ. I think I know somebody I can talk to. Yeah, you can <laughs> probably talk to me. Uh, since I'm like one of the only people not contributing, like not participating in labor that's going to be there. So. Um, I think a lot of expectations are that I'm going to be handling a lot of the back uh, back scenes type of stuff during the conference. So, uh, like, yeah. we still have registration open. So if you're in the Tampa area next weekend, first pitch Arizona uh, at the Marriott Sheridan Clearwater. Uh, we've had it there before in 2020. Uh, there was a pandemic where, like, two weeks afterwards that we closed down everything and all that stuff. But, like, uh, Clegg's going to be there. Jeff's going to be there. Uh, a lot of other people that you know. Uh, you had James on your show, right? Yes. Yeah, Eric he's going to be there. And, J and Jesse Roach last week. Oh, I yeah. Are going to be there, in fact. Yeah. So there you go. Yeah, I, it's a great time every year. I'll put it out there. Um, perfect place to be. You got a bunch of different spring training parks you can hit up. Go to some of these sessions. I think even taking in the the auctions are a, a good time because they're actual real leagues that people are you know working towards studying for um i got my teeth kicked in last year in nl labor i'm i'm not ashamed to say it i came in last it was the first time i have come in last in a long time and uh, i'm out here now i'm searching for answers you know I'm, I'm training differently i'm embarrassed by my performance chris dylan chris so i'm going back and you know i'm, I'm not playing around I know what I did wrong. Got to got to value the saves in labor, all right? Especially an NL only league. I did not pay for saves. That was a major mistake. <laughs> It'll be my first year in labor, so I'm uh I'm in the AL and I'm a little bit nervous to be in a live auction, so it should be pretty fun. Oh, it, oh it's fun. Yeah, it's fun. Uh You got to just you, you know what? I don't think it's like there's like anxiety, like heading up to my first one. Like when I did it with, with tout the first time, I feel like if you're in the auction though, like the easiest thing is to get caught up in like a pick or something. Like you just have to be like head in the swivel. Like you just have to like lose, move on, win, yeah. move on. And just like kind of know where you're at. Um, Cause things in those auctions move quickly. And you'll also see like some of the more experienced players. And I think I really noticed this in labor versus tout. Cause you do get like more experienced players there's like a certain bid cadence that some of these guys have. And it's like trying to pick up on some of that. Like, and it's, it's interesting. I, I actually yeah. think labor was, uh, was de definitely a very different experience for me from, from tout where like I've done pretty well, 
But like I said, I got my teeth kicked in the label. So my, I can't, my first, I can't say anything but respect to all those guys. My my first year in touts, I um you know kind of used the labor, you know, see how that draft went. And it went completely different, even with some of the same uh, participants uh, in AL only uh, labor who, you know, Chris is going to be a part of that um, and AL only tout. Uh, I just tell you to be yourself, man. Like that's, that's the best way. Uh, you're a better fantasy player. Than I don't. I am, so like... Chris, that means like if I be myself in a draft, like I have to fight being myself. Cause I'm like, I just spent 90% of my budget on hitting. <laughs> Where's the fishers? I, I, I'm rolling. I'm rolling out there with dollar closers, and <laughs> <laughs> that's that's me. Like I want to punt catchers. I want to punt pitching, <laughs> and I'm like, I'll stream it. Uh, that's why I'm not. I'm like, I'm fine in mixed leagues because that strategy works. You know, um, and the funniest thing is Dylan will think this is funny going back to our show with with James Anderson. And by the way, this is not the topic for tonight, people. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, <laughs> I was so batting average heavy last year. And that was like my offensive carrying tool that I almost looked back on it. And I was like, I'm, I'm, I'm chasing power, like home runs and steals this year. I'm going up to home runs, steals, runs. That's the differentiator. I don't care about batting average. I'll let that come. Cause I felt like I was so deficient in other areas because I had like all these guys that were like 280 hitters, you know? And I don't know if some of the value was sucked out of that. Dylan can probably speak to this better than I can. I don't know if value was sucked out of hitters like that, particularly like in an L format when, you know, now there's designated hitter, but on top of that, you know, the, the shifting rules and all that sort of thing could have had an impact, you know, batting average. I don't know, obviously rose a little bit, but I think for a lot of those contact guys, maybe it was, unless you're like Louis Arias, like you're pretty much, you know, kind of not necessarily uh, getting anything but empty average. Is that how it played out, Dylan, or not? Because I felt like I was way too heavy on that, but like light and weird areas, and my pitching was a disaster. I got Freddie Peralta right, and like everything else was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I my strategy is always get those rate stats, so I weigh batting average heavier, I weigh whip and ERA heavier. So when you have a cushion, if you have a lead, if you've done it right, and you have you're in the top half, you can stream hitting and pitching with uh you know little little regret little guilt because you've kind of built that cushion so if you i i overcorrect i i do it way too much that than like what the dollar values would suggest just so that i can do that because it just makes decisions easier as you go you just pick the two two start starters and not worry that it's going to crush your whip or whatever it was hard to stream though i mean like because in NL only there's just not a ton and i felt like last year there were just so much there was seemed to be more depth from week to week in terms of like al <clears throat> rookies that would come up or whatever because that's really what you're bidding on because a lot of those guys aren't necessarily rostered and like the nl guys that were coming up it, it was pretty much like emma sheehan like everybody else was, was rostered more or less you know um and you know forget about corbin carroll who went for like 24 25 or you know jordan walker who that was when things were hot. That was like, like that was when like Walker homered, I think twice in the game before my auction, like earlier that day, he homered twice. And like the price was like just skyrocketing at that point. Cause it was like, yeah, he's probably going to break camp with the team. That might've been like peak Jordan Walker price. And the funniest thing is not the funniest, that's actually the saddest thing. But if the, the auction happened on Saturday, and the Andrew Painter news happened Friday evening that if it had happened like 24 hours, 48 hours later, the announcement about Painter, I bet you somebody would have went out and spent $17 on Painter. And it might've been me. So it could have been worse. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, those are my battle stories from, from my NL labor last year. We got off on a long tangent, but I have smart people in the room. So I'm trying to, you know, ask questions, maybe, maybe learn, but the real topic I want to talk about is we have people here who apply real life scouting sort of based information through a fantasy lens, whether that be data, um, whether that be in-person looks, whether that be sources in terms of actual um, team sources, scouts, et cetera, that they might talk to, cross checkers, whatever. Um, and, you know, I think that we all have a good experience of kind of working fantasy space but also some real life stuff as well 
Um, so that's why I brought this group together. I wanted to have a conversation like this. I'm going to start out with Chris, who's doing which this one? Live. <laughs> Too many Chris. Chris. I know Chris Bless. <laughs> start out with with blessing. You've been doing Bless this. <laughs> You've been doing this for a while. Um, yes. You know, you were one of the early adopters in terms of in-person looks, applying that through a fantasy lens. Um, you've worked on the team side as well, on the amateur side, obviously do your pro stuff in the public space. So you, you have a lot of different sort of inputs. You have some access to data as well. Um, how do you sort when you're when you're valuing prospects? Because I think this is something that we've talked about in all the different shows. But I think it's obviously from league to league dependent. But when it comes to your prospect strategy, so how you're going out and getting prospects on the wire, the prospects you're trading for, the guys you're drafting in FYPD, or the prospects that you're drafting in a startup. How are you using all that information, all those different inputs, whether it is the in-person scouting stuff? scouting reports that are getting sent to you, you know, or the data, how are you using that to shape prospect strategy in terms of guys you might be going after other guys you might not like, what are the things you're looking for too? So like I came into the space as uh, like, I came in because I was doing prospect coverage and in the early um, last part of last decade, there wasn't really much money to be made in anything other than, um, you know, if you were at one of the big sites like Baseball America or, or something like that. So around 2014, I kind of transitioned, started writing for fantasy uh, and got paid. I mean, we got some folks here that are now doing it full time. Congratulations, Chris, uh, on, on going full time on that. I'm so happy for you. Uh, but like, so like I come from a very different Point of view i wasn't a fantasy player really until uh i started writing about it actually there would be little fantasy nuggets on my first things that somebody would write in there because like i didn't have any idea of what i was doing in fantasy and kind of had to teach myself and i've become a solid dynasty player uh my redraft's not that great uh, uh but i'm getting better like every year so i i feel pretty confident that hopefully i can get a uh, top three finish in something of, of meaning soon in redraft but uh i i've always been very reliant on my scouting eye uh, especially when i'm managing my my own teams uh you know i i use the statistics and i use like uh, stat cast data that sort of thing anything that i can uh, you know usually get from a source uh but most of it's really to just confirm my eyes and my looks uh on guys i i i get to see probably 20 to 30 really good prospects a year on the pro side. I mean, we, we see a lot of those guys that are, um, I call them tweeners. We spent just so folks know, like the Ronald Acuna's the scouts, uh, see a Ronald Acuna in the minor leagues. They don't spend much time on a Ronald Acuna. You see what Ronald Acuna is. You spend most of the time on those guys like Michael Chavis. That's a perfect example of a guy that I probably spent more time in trying to evaluate because I didn't necessarily know where he fit. Uh, he hit the ball really hard. And, and we've seen like he's had a life. I guess it would be like a roll four ish type of life in the, in the major leagues sort of uh, sort of thing. But like there was that potential there that he could have been like a, a 55 player. Uh, where he's an average regular and in fantasy that that's that's really good when you can get maybe a top 10 top 12 producer at a position uh so like i spend what i do like i don't spend my time on the ronald acunas of the world or the junior cabaneros if we're gonna like you know put it to put it to now i spend my time on the michael chavises those are the guys that i want to figure out um you know as as you guys uh, talked about with james anderson a few weeks ago you know, really and truly, the top 25 is the, uh, the bread and butter. I want to use my scouting acronym, whatever sourced information I can get, and then also, uh, you know, my sourced uh, information from scouts on those guys that fall further away from that to try to figure out which guy is going to be the next guy that kind of blows up. Uh, and, and, like, there was some buzz for Chavis at one point, and like that was my time to cash out because I still hadn't figured him out. Like I still like he was a guy that I just kept spending a lot of time on. And those guys, the guys that might be hyped at another place that I'm not that high on, I tend to want to get rid of them um, when I haven't figured them out. 
That's the second time Michael Chavis has come up in a podcast in the last 48 hours for me. So that's all. Awesome. Yeah. I had someone comp Tommy White to Michael Chavis. That wasn't pretty. <laughs> Chris, kind of the same question here. Um, you're going to the ballpark on a regular basis. You know, you obviously utilize stat cast data, et cetera. Talk to, to contacts. How are you utilizing that and then sort of blending that with your, how does it inform your fantasy rankings? You know, how more, much more confident do you feel sometimes maybe going in on a, on a particular player, um, you know, versus another site that may be a little bit, uh, you know, I don't know, more bashful with the rank. Yeah. So I think there's a good way to blend all of it together. I think you see some people that just want to be all numbers. You see with some people that just want to argue for just the eye test, but I think there's a good blend for all of it that helps inform us. And so obviously I do find live looks extremely valuable. I think going to the ballpark is pretty critical in my evaluations. And it's something that, you know, I try to do a little more every year. And I think that it helps inform opinions when you can see and kind of, you know, when you see something on the field and then the, you see the underlying data and it backs it. It's like, okay, I feel really good about this now. If I have a, a strong opinion of what I saw, and then also the data backs it too, it's like, okay, I feel pretty good. Or you're talking to people at the ballpark too. And I think that's probably as valuable as just getting the live looks is just making contacts and talking to people. And you get building sources is huge. And you get inside information from other people at the ballpark too that I think helps inform your opinions. And so being able to mesh those things together. I think when people that you respect or people that are working in orgs that have that valuable opinion, they give you something. When I can go and see it then, when I can look at the data and back it all and kind of blend it all together, I think it's helpful to just to inform that opinion. And I do think that the scouting side of it is really valuable for fantasy too because you can see things that maybe the fan graphs page doesn't tell you. You see things about a player and the way they handle themselves on the field. I think that's pretty underrated too, beyond just the performance is the way a player goes about their business. And, you know, you see a guy on the mound, like, are they confident? Are they that bulldog mentality? And I think that's very informative when you can look and you can see that. Or how emotional are they when they're striking out? And you know, it's crazy to even say that, but you look and you say like, okay, I think those things are very helpful to see. And Kind of all those things kind of blended together, I think, help form a good evaluation. And then turning into fantasy, it's like, okay, like, you know, I really believe in this guy because I've seen him. I've got the data. And, you know, other people's opinions are valued too. And so I think all that helps inform the evaluation and ranking process for a dynasty purpose. Yeah, I totally agree. And that's, um, I think, particularly when I, st I started to really dive into like FYP rankings. I started going out to the Cape more, started following, you know, the videos on PG, um, a lot of those PG accounts, et cetera, that are out there. Um, and that's not to say that like word is gospel on everything that they say. Uh, word's not gospel on everything that we say, you know, uh, even though we're also full time, like it doesn't matter, but it gives you an introduction in terms of like being able to get your own eyes on players and like, do I necessarily like put out like straight up my rankings when it comes to like the prospect side of things or the scouting report side of things? No, not necessarily. Like I'm talking to team sources and bouncing it off, but being able to go out and see players and be informed of like, I know this guy has, you know, when I talk about it on my other show with Matt Pajek, this guy's got more press from the exposure funnel. He was famous at 15 years old, right? He was on the USA national U15 team. And this guy was because this guy was a later bloomer. This guy, you know, went to Wright State or whatever it is. Um, but when you see Tyler Black versus whatever college here was, you know, ranked higher, went higher in that draft that hasn't been as productive, it's easy to see. Like, yeah, I saw Tyler Black catch up to 99 on consecutive days against like Jack Leiter when he actually could throw strikes. And, you know, Kumar Rocker uh, when he was healthy and still like, you know, you know, Kumar Rocker. So, you know, I think it's um, I think it's important to see that. I think it's important to see how players move, right? How that how do they get to it? Um, I know Tyler Jennings. I think uh, shout out to Tyler Jennings for Prospects Live, former colleague of mine, was was in an airport. I think or stuck somewhere today and decided to do an AMA. 
And he had said something like when someone was asking, like, what are the things that stick out to you when you see a prospect? And I forget how he worded it, but it was more like, you know, ease of operation, that sort of things. But it comes down to how, how you move. You know, I think for me, it's like seeing the body, seeing the physicality. Big leaguers are big. You know, um, they're big guys. I know that we see the outliers. We see the Jose Ramirez's. You know, we see the Mookie Betts's and the Corbin Carroll's and stuff like this. But like Corbin Carroll and Mookie Betts and some of these guys to get to that point, they have to be outlier athletes for their size. And they have to be incredibly skilled players. Like to be the best in a sport, you have to have either elite, you know, skill or elite athleticism with some skill or a mix of the both, you know. Um, and I think that's the thing that like sticks out to me is like, how do guys move? Like when I saw Spencer Jones in the Cape, Jones wasn't the prospect that he is now, but it was like some six foot six guy that can hit for some power, you know, was a former two way player that's now committed to, you know, full time on the position side. He runs pretty well. He can steal bases. He can play center field in a big center field in a place like Orleans as a visiting player and know what he's doing. It's like, all right, like this is this is something. And you saw Jones's draft stock continue to climb, I think, as more people saw him and got associated and you know, got a feel for the type of player that he is. Um, I think so often in rankings, as players move up from high school players in the amateur space to then college or draft, and there's obviously a blend of the two, so much of it is based on like what's happening in games when they're 16, 17 years old. And a lot of that pedigree sticks with players for a long time, or even what they do in the SEC. I mean, you go back and you look at some of these players, like I have the Blue Jays for year round coverage. They took Cade Dowdy super high. Cade Dowdy was a legitimate high school draft prospect, ended up, you know, going to LSU, you know, storied career at LSU, father played there, brother played at LSU. Um, Goes on, you know, as a, I think a comp round pick, you know, when the Blue Jays had that, that cluster of picks uh, in 2022. And you look at the underlying data, it's pretty subpar. The skills aren't all that great. You know, I think is like 90th percentile exit velocity was like 99, hundred miles an hour. And this is like a 22 year old experienced college guy. Like it's, it's wild to sort of see it when you're like, all right, this guy hit in college, blah, blah, blah. Scouting reports are there. But then you start to see some of the data on the pro side. You start to see some of the looks on the pro side. And I think that's where like you can often inform like what's actually happening. Like I think one of the, the toughest things is getting the information on the amateur side, seeing players on the amateur side, and then trying to translate to the type of players they're going to be in pro ball. Because it's often it's not the same. I mean, we've seen it with high profile guys recently too. I just recently wrote about Tamar Johnson, and I think some of the 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 disappointment I'll say around Tamar is the fact that he's not a three hundred hitter. He's not a three twenty hitter. You know, he's a guy that hits for power. He's got bat speed. He's going to take his walks. He's probably overly passive at times. He's also really really young. Has a fair amount of skills. Um, and I think if this was a second round pick, people would be ecstatic about Tamar Johnson, yeah, right? I almost feel like they'd be more apt to rank him higher, where it's almost like sometimes that can work against the player as well. Um, but we're always chasing that. Robert Hassel the third never really produced the way that I think we thought he was going to, um, based on what the prep pedigree was, what the, the prospect pedigree was initially coming out of the draft. It happens a lot. You know, I think there's such an adjustment period. Um, it's funny. It'll be funny to see how some of the FYPD picks from this year, particularly looking years down, down the line, because there's so, so much depth, you know, but Dylan, I got off on a little bit of a tangent there. We we're talking obviously about this. You are not an at the game sort of guy. You're, but you're somebody who translates data. I think, you know, understands the information that's coming through and tries to think of it from, you know, a, a baseball lens. Um, You've started working with more advanced stat cast data over the last couple of years to inform projections. What's the value that's that you've found from it? And I'll even say on the other side, like what are some some things you maybe have overvalued at times that you wish you didn't and things that maybe you undervalued? 
Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. <laughs> um, I guess just to preface it, I'm sure everyone knows I, I'm not a scout. I didn't come from the scouting side. Like I'm like the reverse Chris Blessing. I started in fantasy and then I'm kind of trying to learn how to how to scout. And I don't know how to scout. So I do weigh and, and rely heavily on the data. Like if I see if I see John Carlos Stanton swing, I don't think that's a good swing. But obviously he's capable of hitting home runs. I think it's just so ugly. And I if I was a scout, I don't know. My biases would say, nah, forget this guy. Um, so yeah, I, I rely on the data. Um, I also rely on just the way we kind of aggregate projections. Um, just as an analogy, to kind of aggregating projections is more accurate than just taking a single projection system. Like the wisdom of the crowds tends to kind of smooth out outliers and it's more accurate. I try to blend as much as I can. So kind of speaking to what Chris Clegg was saying about, you know, you take your looks, you take your data, you take the underlying, you take um, what sources are telling you, you kind of blend it, you weigh it together. You try to, you know, take that recipe and and figure out what the, the actionable information is from, from the data. Um, so I kind of do the same thing with the blending. I take, I've talked about this before, where if I take a stat like strikeout rate, this is an easy one. Um, strikeout rate at face value is very important. It's very, uh, translatable. It's, it stabilizes very quickly as you move up levels as a prospect. It's, there's kind of like a, uh, there's a lot of, um, predictive ability in the strikeout rate. Um, and so that's great. But other things predict strikeout rate, like swinging strike rate or, you know, your contact rate or your in-zone contact rate. So I try to, like, blend all of those together to get sort of an aggregate strikeout rate. Same with, like, OPS. Um, you can take slugging. And what informs slugging? Oh, this informs slugging. And sometimes, like, exit velocity informs slugging. And launch angle informs slugging. And so you can create, a, like, an expected slugging. And that gives you an expected OPS. And so you're kind of aggregating projections in a way you have an ops you have an expected ops you have an expected ops from stack has you kind of blend them all together and that tends to be more accurate that's what i've found so um it kind of suits my personality and that i'm hedging i i don't like to take take uh, gambles or risks or put myself out there so like you know you hedge so it's like it does it's a justifiable justifiable decision or opinion by hedging from a number of sources and, and putting it together so yeah, I think I I tend to I tend to rely heavily on new stuff um, because um, it's kind of it's it's uh, you know you can be the kind of the first to look into it and, and plant your flag and so maybe you know you weigh things like like stuff plus I really like stuff plus um, and I'm happy to see that it does uh, bear out as being predictive. Um, it's not the be all end all, but it because it's sort of a newer space and you know established things like strikeout rate, minus walk rate, um, you can you you maybe have an advantage over over some of the laggards who are still kind of catching up to the technology. You know, I kind of talked a lot there, but no, 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 it's perfect, and I think it it kind of segues nicely into like the next thing that I wanted to touch on, and that is I appreciate systems like this that can aggregate a bunch of information and compare it against the average and decipher, you know, what's an, an above average set of skills, what's an elite set of skills, you know, what's a plus plus, you know, truly like whatever, like set of skills. And then below those thresholds as well, because um, it helps you very quickly sort of be able to, with a whole player pool and a whole lot of different data, Q in on, all right, these are some guys that I should probably watch. These are players that I now want to go and dig into the video on. Oh, wow. I didn't realize that, you know, um, Chad Dallas's slider graded out as highly as it does. I'm going to see Dallas tomorrow in New Hampshire. I guess I got to pay attention to that slider and, and why it's working, right? Like, I feel like it feeds each other. Like, there are times where you know, I'll go and, like, I saw Connor Cook and I was like, wow, this guy looks incredible. And I remember texting you, Dylan, as I was coming back from the park. And you were like, yeah, Robo Scout picked him up a week, like this week, actually. That's funny that you brought that up. And it's like, it's nice when the two things marry. And I don't think there's a disconnection. Um, I think it's off, often great as like almost like a roadmap to be able to put your efforts in the right place. Because all of us, especially on the fantasy side, like on the real life side, I'm fortunate enough to have a team here. And I only have to cover 
certain areas with like, you know, um, precision and expertise where the bigger stuff, you know, I do lean on Josh and JJ and some of the other people here at the team. Um, when it comes to fantasy, like it's, it's you and me, Dylan, and, you know, Chris at your site, it's, it's you and some of the other guys in your team, Chris, you know, it's you and some of the other guys in the team on the prospect side. It's really tough to cover the entire, entire minor leagues and not miss good performers or have the right guys in the right spot, especially, you know, when you're doing rankings, if you're going beyond five or six, it's often like that nine to 20 area. It's like, do I have the right blend of guys there? And you need some numbers. You need something else. Unless you do one system and that's it. You know, you only cover the Red Sox prospects. It's a little bit easier to do that, right? But when you're trying to cover everything and have some precision about what you're putting out there, like I feel like you need the numbers, you need systems like RoboScout, et cetera, to, to point you in the right directions and sometimes get you off of your biases too, you know? Chris, I know that you're some, I keep on saying Chris, there's two of you. Um, Clegg, Mr. Clegg, you, uh, Mr. You, Clegg. You, use, you use data. And I know that we have conversations about this stuff all the time. Um, how does that help you sort of inform decisions, point you in the right direction? Um, and how do you use it to, to navigate this structure of the minor leagues that has thousands of players? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think you have to use it because there's no way to see every player like with so many players in the minors and coverage being limited like it'd be awesome if i could fly to a different part of the country every week and go you know see every league but yeah you know, i'm pretty limited in what i see and i and like i feel like i'm pretty fortunate in my area that i have like seven minor league teams within a couple of hours so you know i'm mostly in greenville so i get red Sox coverage i get other high A teams that come in I can go to Columbia and get single A coverage and I can go to Gwinnett and get triple A coverage. But still, it's very hard to see everybody because it's still just one league. It's not covering the entire triple A. Like I'm only getting some international teams and I'm only really going to Gwinnett in the case like there's players I haven't seen that I want to see. And so it makes it hard. And I think having data to point you in the right direction, it's like, all right, this is very helpful. And you're right. There's always guys that you'll see it and you're like, wow, like I really didn't realize that this guy had just such good stuff on a pitch or like this guy hit the ball as hard as he did. And then on the flip side, you see things and it's like, OK, I think I remember texting you about uh, somebody in the Ranger system. I don't remember who it was. It was this guy in Hickory and it was like Cepeda might have been his last name, Gisele Cepeda. And like this guy showed up and I didn't really know much about him. And like this, he looked like an incredible athlete, he was like six foot four. He smoked a couple balls. So I text Jeff about it. I'm like, hey, you know anything about this guy? We chatted and the, the data was just like horrific. I'm like, okay, that's so interesting because this helps because you see things and you may see a guy one time and it's like, okay, you may get a really good look on one day, but what does the rest of the season looks like? Because one game only matters such a small percentage. So it is helpful to get multiple looks, but having the data for full season certainly helps push you in the right direction and especially on those guys that you don't know. And I think that's the most important evaluations because it's like, okay, of course the top prospects are going to have good data, but we need to find those other guys. And finding those outliers, it's like nobody's talking about. Having access to the data and seeing it, it certainly pushes you in the right direction in that sense. Yeah, I think Can I make a point, Jeff. Sure, go right ahead. So like before, before we had as advanced uh, um, internal data or whatever, StatCast data, uh, like I saw Joe Ryan pitch and that was a guy like it was eye opening to see how the hitters were responding to his pitches. Uh, they weren't responding. I mean, um, <laughs> like he was absolute dominant uh, when I saw him in double A and then watched video on him. Saw, and I think there was a good article that Josh Norris did on him at around the same time that I saw him. But like if I had that data going into that start, I would have I would have had Joe Ryan circled to to go instead of being down the first baseline watching um Royce Lewis take take swings against him and going oh this is this is ugly these swings are ugly and then run into the you know back behind home plate because I need to see what this is what what this is about and like watching his and specifically release point like his release point was he released the ball so late. Like I haven't seen a guy release it that late 
at that level without knowing that he had a release point like that. Like those things are so much more valuable. And we're only talking a few years. I mean, we're not talking this long time. I mean, Joe Ryan, what oh, yeah. is third pro year of uh, major league year, third or fourth major league year. Like it, it's, it was, it was such a big deal then. And I think now like a Joe Ryan would be picked out by, by Dylan's uh, system. Like he would pick that guy out and, uh, you know, so then there's not as much mystery for you and I or for uh, Chris to to find at the ballpark. I even think there's a lot of that that happens on the amateur side, that they're identifying traits and characteristics of these guys in college, like Mason McCray, my, my buddy who's now with the Red Sox, did that for, for a while in the public space. There's others doing it. Johnny Davis, who I know is taking a job with the Blue Jays. It's a good hire, Dylan. Uh, he's been doing it in the public space with college already this season. Um, you know, I think that the coverage of baseball at all levels has expanded and the access to information at all levels, you know, um, has certainly expanded. But that being said, I'm getting older in this. I've been doing this for a longer period of time. I've been exposed to more things over the last couple of years, just in the day in, day out, working at Baseball America. The thing that I'm starting to find, this is blessing, this is a question I wanted to go to you with. Yeah. The things that I'm starting to find is I feel like a lot of the data, a lot of the information, when I'm talking to coaches about how data is applied and how it may differ in terms of what they focus in on for one particular hitter versus another same side thing on the pitching side starting to realize that some of these tried and true sort of cliches within scouting are true that size matters with pitchers i was into all these 5 11 6 foot release height guys a couple years ago that were just low release height guys the jack lighter types right yes. that's proven to be like those guys are relievers man and like you talked to old scouts back then, and I thought it was smart and was like, oh, whatever. This guy's always talking about. They were all right. They all ended up as into the bull. They all ended up in the bullpen, right? Like it's all those guys end up the books. They're not big enough to handle it, right? And I feel like it's the same when we're talking about certain defensive characteristics. We're talking about certain types of swings. As we get more and more data, we're able to look beyond just like one number. Like, oh, he hits the ball hard, like with his average. But then we have other numbers that inform us, like, for example, I'm putting out an article tomorrow where I think for 18-year-olds, Cam Collier by far had the highest 90th percentile exit velocity of any of them, and he had the largest sample. But if I was to pull in his expected WOBA, it was the worst of that group because he hits the ball on the ground to his pull side. So there's all these other factors that are like now coming in that are informing us. And I feel like maybe things that we would have gone crazy about two or three years ago when we had very like one dimensional understanding of these numbers, now that they're becoming 2D and maybe 3D, we're getting a better understanding of like, oh, yeah, this guy does feel it fit into that basket or this guy does fit into that basket, you know, and that the outliers are the outliers. And it's, it's something that you can truly, I think, see, you know, when you see Roman Anthony last year, Chris, he looks different from other prospects that you've seen right the best guy in the field is still the best guy in the field you know um guys that throw strikes with stuff it's still gonna work you know like it's stuff like that so chris how much do you feel we got away from certain things and then have been drawn back into them? because i feel like that's where i'm at now where I, i'm yeah. starting to feel like you know there is a certain level of contact you have to make there's a certain level of strikes you have to throw it can't just all be stuff and all exit velocity and chase rates all the time. Okay. <laughs> I, I, this weekend, and I wish I could share like the players that I saw this weekend, but I can't because um, I'm contracted not to tell you right now, but a lot of our conversations between uh, some of the scouts that were at that game, we're talking about the players, you know, five, six years ago in the preps here in the state of Georgia, and making comparisons to those guys. And, um, you know, we valued some things for a while in our space that the, the scouts didn't necessarily do that. Now, there's some teams that have scouts that are very, um, you know, it's always you'll hear stuff like, well, uh, the office 
wants us to check this guy out. Uh, I've seen him before. And a lot, I'll be honest, a lot of those guys that we've seen before, um, they're not, they, they haven't ended up transitioning to pro ball. They've been drafted by somebody because, you know, their, their data look good at Georgia Gwinnett college. Uh, but like, then they get into the minor league system and they're chewed out. They're, they're basically chewed up and spit it out like in three years. Uh, so like, it still comes down to the scouting eye. Uh, a lot of the amateur scouting still comes down to the scouting eye. That's why you have boots on the ground, especially the younger the players, especially with the prep players. Like there's a lot of projection and you're like, you're squinting your eyes at times trying to figure out where is this guy going to end up? Is this guy the next defensive whiz uh, at, at shortstop? Or is he a guy that, might not hit his body weight uh, like Nassim Nunez. Like, uh, you know, that's a, that's a guy that like I got to see when he was here in the state of Georgia as a prep player. I forget what school. Sorry, my dog's barking in the background. Um, <laughs> but like that's that's I know his data wouldn't have been great. Like if we were looking at his data because he, he, he Soaking wet, he barely had any power. Like, it, it just, he wasn't a strong guy. But he was super athletic. He was short and super athletic. And he's made it through the, you know, it just got to his rule five year. He's now with the Nationals, moved on from an organization for the Marlins. Uh, but, like, you know, a guy like that um, maybe got a little bit, uh, would have gotten lost in, like, 2021 in the draft, maybe, just because people were concentrating more on, uh, blast data and that sort of thing, instead of relying on the eyes of their their scouts. So I'm going to throw this one up here because it made me laugh, and it was drink every time Jeff doesn't specify which Chris you would be drunk, my friend. <laughs> and then we have yeah. Reese White, and he wants to know where does one get a shirt like that? Am Amazon. I've worn this three times. I bought it for a, a 50th birthday party. Uh, that was 80s theme. So I went as Magnum PI. Uh, it just so you know, like I don't dress like this normally. I I got this for you know I, I wanted to be colorful for Jeff's uh, birthday. If you notice, all my Super Bowl decorations I, I brought in here. We had a theme party. We had a Taylor Swift, San Francisco 49ers, and Kansas City Chief theme party and stuff. I got these beads from a restaurant called Henry's in Ackworth. Uh, uh, actually, last Friday was a celebration. Was eating was eating with some scouts and Henry, the owner of the place, just throws these and they go right over your neck. Like it's like perfect. Like he's he's like this expert. Great Cajun food. If you guys ever been there, um, ever ever in the Atlanta area or near Lake Point complex, great place to go to in Ackworth. Um, nice. but yeah, I just wanted to like celebrate all of Jeff's errors because <laughs> he's had a lot of them. The error. Eras, not errors. Like here's the backwards, backwards hat era. Like you usually, like back in his prospect live days, every podcast he had a backwards hat on. So that that's my era right now. I had, I had, I had thin, I had thin uh, marathon Spartan Jeff early at Rasball under Ralph Lifshitz. That was the baseball show with Andy Singleton. That was the first. That was the first era. And then it was the the Halp, the Michael Halpern era. We hosted the Prospect podcast. And then it was the Brozdowski era. Then it was the Prospects Live era. And then we had a few eras at Prospects Live. And uh now I'm in my baseball America. Era. Yeah, like you have you have the brand date right there. I mean, and like uh, what hat are you wearing? What that is that oh, Scorpions? It's, it's yeah, Scottsdale Scorpions. This is my Scottsdale favorite. Scorpions. Hat. This is my favorite. This is my favorite hat of any hat that I own. Hands I down. can't okay. wear. I can't it wear has, any. It has all the patches, man. It's all about the patches. See, fanatic. Yeah. This is what it's about: quality and patches. The patches matter. The sewn-on patches matter. We had a long conversation on the on this week's 90th percentile about this, about the uniform. Here, and this is this is the Red Sox era, or you know, going gonna, to Fenway Park and you know, I grew up doing that sort of thing, though, my friend. What? <laughs> I grew up a Dodgers fan, though. I just you did, but you have the Red Sox behind right behind you. I know. Well, it's it's a Mookie. This, I did love this outfit. Yeah, it man. was Mookie, Benintendi, and, and Jackie Bradley. I went to a book fair with my kids at Scholastic. They have a warehouse near me. We're really getting off topic here. And 
I wanted to just buy a bunch of sports posters for the basement, like when we redid the walls and stuff. So I have like a Celtics poster here that has Gordon Hayward on it and Kyrie Irving. It's wonderful. Oh, wow. Yeah. And then I have uh, a, yeah, just random stuff. So it's just random stuff. They obviously only sell Boston stuff around here. They obviously. Have- I mean, we're, we're like the people are just tuning out as we're saying you're talking about this. Yeah, no, I, th- I think they're thoroughly this. entertained or, or, or they're all like, uh, you know, maybe Chris Clegg's the one that we need to start following. I, I know, right? out of this silliness. <laughs> um, I think they already are. Um, I know, I'm sure they are. But uh, that being said, you know, I, you brought up an interesting point because I think it's funny because there are phases. We're starting to see phases with certain data, too as certain metrics come out of vogue, right? The thing that I'm seeing now is a lot of questions on certain metrics that were hyped heavily on like that sensors, like early connection, things like that, where players are out, coaches are out. It's not something that's getting put into models as much as it used to. Um, And it seems like it's going more toward like force plate data and like athletic testing. That's the stuff whenever I'm talking to anybody that's putting together models for teams, it seems like force place data is coming up a ton, particularly on the amateur side. And I think it's like trying to find the stuff that they find to be predictive. And I think they're finding force plate data and being able to measure power capacity, output, you know, athletic capacity. Because we're not talking about where a player is, it's where a player can get to, you know. And I mean, you know. To the Astros' credit, I believe that's how they were on Zach Desenzo was his force plate data was awesome. So that's why they were all over him. Yeah. You know? I, I spoke I spoke to a um, – in 2021, end of 2021, I spoke to a cross-checker who was like, this This is the new – this is the new wave right here. This is going to be what catches on. And his organization was trying to, trying to get to it before everybody else, and he already knew that somebody was at – about the same point in time, uh, another organization was was there, um, you know, doing the same thing. It's that's how baseball is. Whatever is being discussed right now is going to be the thing in two years. Like that's just that's just how it is. That's how these teams, like the Astros, the Orioles, and any number of amount of teams, stay ahead of the curve. Is that they're always thinking and always trying to get uh, get to the next best thing to evaluate players. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, you're just you're just starting to see a lot more focus on not necessarily numbers and production, but more so on like characteristics and traits that teams feel that they can they can optimize, you know. But here, I actually think there's something we're going way off topic here, but we're gonna it's my birthday, so I'm gonna talk about the thing <laughs> that I that this is my Roman Empire, right? You know that meme about the Roman Empire. It's batted ball spin, and it's something that I know teams are working on that we don't know anything about in the public space because we don't have access to actual spin rates on batted balls, right? Like in terms of big numbers and being able to understand it. But I think that's the biggest thing is how certain pitches are hit a certain way and which hitters naturally create not loft but carry. Like the same way, you know, there's carry on a four-seam fastball. There are definitely guys that can hit a variety of pitches more flush than other hitters, and the ball goes further than it should. You know, Bregman's one of those guys. Votto was one of those guys. Mookie Betts is one of those guys. Like, that's something that I think is getting figured out on the back end that we don't even know. And, like, that's the thing that I kind of wonder about in the future of like hitters starting to optimize their swings to be able to cover certain deficiencies that they had that, you know, we couldn't necessarily connect the dots the same way that, you know, we could maybe in the future that we can now, you know, that's the, like, cause there has to be right. If there's properties like that with a pitch moving in, whether it's a top spin on a curveball or whether it's ride on a four seam, you know, the seam shifted wake we're talking about with certain sliders and change ups and two seam fastballs. There have to be properties like that when the balls hit, right? We see it with golf swings. I mean, like when you see all the, like, if you have anybody who's like a golf nut on any of your social media and they go out into the, the course or the, you know, the range and they're doing rap soto on it and you're getting the readings on it, 
they have all that stuff. They figured all that stuff out. Now, obviously, it's a stationary ball as opposed to a ball that's coming in with properties that you then need to react to, which makes it harder to read. But I think that's the next thing. I think it's figuring out what's going on once the ball hits the bat beyond just like hit ball hard, hit ball in air, hit ball on ground. Because that's really all we think about it as like now where I feel like we're so much more advanced in terms of how we think about pitching, though it's just so much harder to unlock. Dylan, what do you think about that? I'm throwing out some some pie in the sky type of theories here. I'm um, I'm just talking like we're a bunch of college guys hanging out on a Friday night. Making up and talking about space and robots. And Dylan, this is just like first pitch, uh, um, Arizona, like in, in Florida. Like, this is what we do. This is, and for anybody out there, I hate to interrupt, but like, this is literally, you get to do this sort of conversation with with all of these type of guys and, and even more in the fantasy space, um, just talking and, and having these conversations like you're back in college or in high school about. Just these random things. Sorry to interrupt. No, 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 that's good. Pl plug first pitch, the first pitch, Arizona and, and Florida. That's great. Um, I I believe, um, just like in fantasy, we're all trying to find edges. So we're all trying to find the next thing. We're all trying to stay ahead of the competition. The margins are getting slimmer and slimmer. I think I think you're onto something, Jeff, in terms of that, as like, what's the next thing? Is it is it machine learning? Is it neural nets? Is it backspin on baseballs? Like I think. My anecdotal observations are that baseball is always changing and then something works and then everyone starts to copy it and then that becomes the thing and then something else happens. So it's always like kind of like changing it up, always kind of being unique. Like I think, you know, there's like seam shifted wake and then that was kind of hot for a while and tunneling and that's kind of hot for a while. I, I'm being very reductive. Um, and then the fastball builds even. I think all of that builds right and it creates this this bigger picture more things that you're looking at now in the pie right yeah no i i think you're absolutely right so tunneling you want the the fastball high in the zone and the curveball down so when it comes out of the hand they both kind of have the initial same trajectory and then people catch on that if you're throwing fastballs in the zone maybe if they're flatter and have more ride or rise more carry then the ball's not doing what the batter's expecting and then Batters are smart too, so they're going to make adjustments. So just like we saw the Rangers, the World Series, where it was like famously they were doing batting practice and like swinging above where they thought the ball would be, and then Seager yeah. hit the home run off Seawold, all that stuff. So like that's going to be the thing. So maybe high carry fastballs are going to be the average, and fastballs that don't rise as much is going to be next. Or I we see with thinking. I think we're starting to see just more personalized arsenals, like. The guys who can ride are going to ride it, and the guys that shouldn't be aren't. Where we had a period in time a few years ago, 2000, 2001, um, 2021, excuse me, 2000, 2020, 2021. <laughs> I'm old. Um, we're like the spider tack generation where like everybody was riding it. Part of that was the fact that everybody could ride it. So, yeah. you know, we saw with the tack ball, like, you know, the ride that Andrew Abbott had. And then he went to AAA without the tack ball. And it was like, oh, he was a 16.3 and not 19.2 or the, the crazy number was. But it's like, I had like 20 something. That's that's what I had. Yeah, I mean, when you're up, or if you're averaging 19, you're popping some 20s. But like, yeah. you know, that's what that did, right? And I think that's like when that came away, all of a sudden guys couldn't sneak that any longer. And there's certain, like, you don't have to have a ton of ride to be effective in the top of the zone. You can still throw a four seam fastball that's kind of flat and dead zone at the top of the zone. And if you land it in the right spots, it's going to be an effective pitch, especially if it's setting up a cascading changeup or another secondary, right? But, you know, I think that we're starting to see guys personalize the arsenals based on a type of, like, we have pitching coaches and pitching coordinators that are understanding pronator versus supinator, which is not something I think a lot of people had a great understanding of a few years ago of like this dude's wrist doesn't move that way you know but he can do this so we should focus on him throwing this kind of a fastball versus this you know so like there's no it's no one way to eat a Reese's that's that's what we're going to call this episode there's no wrong way to eat a Reese's multiple ways to sort of get there but Chris what do you say because we're wrapping up here but in terms of like the next thing we had somebody ask us about this do you think it's understanding Batted ball spin, do you think it's something else? 
that's the one for me where I'm like, if I could understand why X player has a ton of power, but doesn't hit for as many home runs as this guy, it might be more of a red flag than something that, you know, I might've ignored previously, but is there something else that is in your mind of like, when you start to think about the future that could be out there? Yeah. So it's an interesting case. And I think the individualized approach, like you mentioned is very important because I think we've seen some organizations like basically do a cookie cutter approach. And I think that's evolving and changing, but you're right. Some guys just aren't going to throw a riding four seam. They need to throw a, a running sinker. Like it just better suits how they throw the baseball and certain guys aren't going to be able to throw certain pitches. And so the individualized approach is huge. The batted ball spin is interesting. And as a golfer, like, like that's something that matters. And so I think that if, we're able to quantify that a little more. And as you mentioned, it's a completely different game. We're talking about a moving pitched ball that's already spinning versus a ball that's sitting still. But I do think that having a better understanding of guys that backspin balls well, like I just look at like a Alex Bregman, for instance, like I assume like he's a guy that backspins the ball incredibly well, like having no data on that because he doesn't hit the ball hard. He really doesn't barrel the ball up all that well. But he still is able to hit from home run, home runs. And we know that he has that pool approach that works. Like he's hitting in the Crawford boxes. Like Isak Paredes is a similar guy in that kind of sense where the the hard hit, the exit velocity data is not great, but they're still hitting for home runs. And I think that if we had the batted ball spin, we could better quantify. It's so, okay, like this player is really good at doing this and they're making this work with their swing. And I do think that the individualized approach for every player could be a more of a trend in the sense of like this works for one player, but it's not necessarily going to work for another player and being able to quantify that better with numbers certainly helps support that. Like this guy may have a really funky swing, but it works for him because of certain traits that he can like things that he pulls off. And I know it sounds weird to say, but like there's guys in the majors that don't have these picturesque swings, but it works. Yeah. So I'm curious to see like what the next revolution will be. But I think it is interesting. Like it is, we always have to be a step ahead. And I think you're right. The best organizations are always two steps ahead or two years ahead. We think about it like that. Mm. And so they're already revolutionizing these next things that then everybody else will be playing catch up on. So yeah, I am really curious, like what is the next thing with, especially like, batted ball stuff because we have like while well, well, we have a ton of batted ball metrics like pitchers i feel like there's so much more on in the sense of like if you look and you get all the data it's like there's so many different data points that like are helpful to explain things about a pitcher but with a batter like having you know the vertical bat angle or like you know the different kind of things like that obviously bat speed's big too but then the ability to spin a ball a certain way off the bat like some guys just have those traits so I'm really interested to see as those things become like more public per se. Yeah. I think a lot of it would like, you know, VBA and some of these other things is it's tough to measure because if it's just a bat knob, like it's not taking spine into account and some of these other things that are obviously, you know, important to, to measure, right? Like, you know, we can't have these guys completely linked up in sensors like they're, like they're doing their swings and movements for uh, MLB the show or whatever, you know? <laughs> um, but that seems like that's like kind of what you need. You got to have an understanding of like where the spine is. Like that's a huge part of hitting that with like the, the bat, you know, the blast motion sensors and the knob sensors aren't necessarily picking that up. They do a good job of picking up certain things, but there's also ways where like on bad swings and stuff like that, it will pick something up and read it as good when it's not, you know? Um, and I've had coaches say that, uh, just as much, but that being said, we're wrapping this sucker up blessing. Yes. If you have anything you want to plug first pitch, whatever, man, this is the floor. No, is I good. already, I, I already plugged first pitch. Uh, <laughs> so like we'll plug something else. Uh, I, I have the eyes have a podcast. We're, we're going to be coming back very soon. Um, the new baseball HQ website. Uh, we had a huge upgrade just like y'all at baseball America had, uh, last summer. Uh, like it, it's tremendous. It's like taking us into the 2020s finally, like we were in like the early two thousands and now we're in the 2020s and you know, that that's such a big deal. Like it, 
just the ease of how to um, post an article now. Like it's it's just so awesome. Uh, and I, I have a lot of other stuff. I have the, the and this one has a, a Ronald Acuna on the cover. Uh, but I, I write the Phenoms article and uh, Lindy's uh, baseball preview. That's something that doesn't I don't usually get to promote that often. Um, but this is the time. Like print media is still around. You yeah. even know it's it's dying. Hey, man, um, the magazine's doing good. People, yeah, the, the latest uh, uh, issue was like one of the highest selling issues of in history of Baseball America. It was so, an awesome issue. I, I, so I recently finally finished reading it. That was an awesome issue. But like it, it it's just there's so many things I get to do because of baseball. And I'm just so thankful. And like this conversation, uh, talking to three friends about baseball like how great is that like the, it, it's just phenomenal and like there were so many things we could have gone on for like four hours if, if we really wanted to probably absolutely well appreciate you blessing and uh for you for blessing the show today clegg what do you have going on man uh any any work you want to plug anything you got going on over at the dynasty dugout that's posting daily articles of dynasty content prospect content etc recently launched a new daily show dynasty dugout show so doing that pretty much every day during the week now um that'd be live stream form and podcast form so that's really the newest thing but uh yeah just check out the dynasty dugout or on my twitter everything's pretty much posted there but yeah looking forward to seeing you guys and yeah a week and a half that's crazy but yeah i'll be down there i'll be down there in a week yeah thursday thursday that's morning. True. it's not even a week and a half thursday. it's thursday yeah. what is this it's yeah flying fly in thursday night this time next week i'm gonna be uh i'm gonna be in tampa florida on my man dan's couch hanging out <laughs> talking some ball trying to figure out where i went wrong and i'll labor we'll end the show on that too dylan <laughs> dylan Anything you want to say before we wrap up the show here? I'm just going to be that meme of, uh, I think it's the guy from Narcos just by himself alone while all you guys are in Florida. <laughs> <laughs> I'm having severe that's FOMO. That's Pablo Escobar, man. That's that's Pablo. You feel like Pablo? I do. I often do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, we're going to wrap this up. I appreciate everybody tuning in to all four episodes of the Fantasy Summit series. I want to thank all of our guests for coming on. Uh, of course, Dylan and myself, but also J.J. Cooper for the first one, James Anderson for joining us, Eric Cross and Jesse Roach last week, and then this week, the two Chris's, Reek, I said Reek, this week, Reek. the two Chris's, Chris Blessing and Chris Clegg, for Jeff Ponce, for Dylan White, this is another Baseball America podcast. <laughs>